Good to have you with us. This is Arirang News, live from our studio in Seoul. I'm Na Hyun Gyeong. The sky over Seoul is looking gray and yellow because of the fine yellow dust blowing in from China. It's something Korea deals with every year, and it, as it poses health threats to people, officials in Seoul have been working with authorities in Beijing to tackle this issue. Our Lee ji starts us off. It's the worst yellow dust storm in more than four years. The Korea Meteorological Administration issued yellow dust warnings in Seoul and other major cities throughout Korea this Monday morning. Every year, this unhealthy yellow haze drifts from China and Mongolia, carrying with it industrial pollutants and bacteria, none of which are good for your respiratory health. In response, weather authorities here advise people to stay indoors and wear a protective mask and goggles when going outside. But some might ask, why can't we stop the dust from drifting into Korea? What has been done to make this unwelcome guest go away? Korea and China have been working together for over a decade to fight the yellow dust. Public and private groups from both countries have been planting more trees in the deserts of China and Mongolia to slow desertification. The two countries have also established working groups to research ways to counter rising levels of dust pollution and installed high-tech air monitoring equipment. During an environment minister's meeting between China, Japan and Korea last year, the ministers talked about each other's environmental policies and agreed to work together to tackle various environmental issues with improving air quality topping the list. But experts say these efforts are being overwhelmed by China's enormous population and industries that still rely heavily on coal, leading to more air pollution. They say it's time for China to actively develop clean energy to use in place of coal and for its neighboring countries like Korea to better cooperate with China, as environmental problems like yellow dust have consequences that reach far beyond the borders of any one country. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Various media outlets are reporting that Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will likely address the U.S. Congress when he travels to Washington later in April or May. But Korean Americans in the U.S. are already resisting the move, saying he first needs to apologize for Tokyo's wartime atrocities. For more, here's Arirang News' Son Jung In. A source familiar with the issue says Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will likely give a speech before U.S. Congress during his planned visit to Washington in late April or early May. The source said Abe strongly expressed his will to a congressional delegation from the U.S. who recently visited Tokyo. Many U.S. congressional leaders, including House Speaker John Boehner, are known to be leaning toward letting Abe speak to Congress. If Abe gets the green light, it will mark the first time a Japanese prime minister has addressed U.S. Congress in 54 years. Former Prime Minister Hayato Ikeda was the last Japanese leader to give a speech before the House of Representatives all the way back in 1961. Before that, Nobusuke Kishi addressed Congress in 1957 and Shigeru Yoshida in 1954. Abe reportedly wants to speak before a joint session of the lower and upper house, something no Japanese prime minister has ever done before. However, some obstacles stand in his way. Many Korean Americans are opposed to Abe's move as he's expected to promote Japan as a country that has followed a peaceful path since the end of World War II. A task force for a Korean council in Washington for women drafted for military sexual slavery by Japan said they launched a petition campaign on Sunday. They will submit a formal letter to California Congressman Ed Royce, saying they're opposed to the idea unless Abe makes a sincere apology over Japan's historical wrongdoings first. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now, staying with Japan, but on a different topic, Korea has further protested Japan's latest territorial claim to Korea's Tokdo Island. This morning, Korea's foreign ministry summoned Kenji Kanazuki, a minister at the Japanese embassy in Seoul, to protest Japan's celebrations of its Takeshima Day. Now, Takeshima is what Japan calls Tokdo. For the third straight year, the Japanese government dispatched a senior official to Shimane Prefecture to attend the event. Korea denounced the move on Sunday, calling it historically regressive, adding that it raises doubts about Tokyo's sincerity to strengthen ties with Seoul. 
Now, the U.S. is standing by its position of seeking dialogue with North Korea while firmly responding to the regime's provocations. But North Korea watchers say issues in other parts of the world may be diverting Washington's attention away from Pyongyang. Choi Yoo-sun has the story. At the start of 2015, Washington slapped additional sanctions on Pyongyang for its alleged hacking of Sony Pictures late last year. In a State of the Union address later in the same month, however, President Barack Obama excluded any reference to North Korea. Then came the U.S. president's controversial YouTube interview in which he said the North Korean regime will eventually collapse as the Internet penetrates further into the reclusive country. And it is very hard to sustain that kind of brutal uh, authoritarian regime uh, in this modern world. The State Department's official overseeing East Asian affairs days later said that bringing change to North Korea doesn't necessarily involve a collapse of the current leadership. The fact of the matter is we don't have a hostile policy. We have a denuclearization policy. Washington's point man in North Korea, Sung Kim, reportedly failed at a recent attempt to engage with the North in a third country. While Kim has said the U.S. has always taken a two-track approach of enforcing sanctions and keeping the door to dialogue open, it seemed odd for the administration to make such a conciliatory gesture immediately after imposing new sanctions. Analysts suggest with the latest proposal, the administration sought to hold the North accountable for the impasse rather than actually resume talks. North Korea chumming up with Russia as of late is also not a welcome development for the U.S., especially as Moscow has invited both the South and North Korean leaders to its World War II commemorative ceremony in May. And that, according to some analysts, prompted President Obama to cause a stir. All in all, crises in the Middle East and Ukraine, along with prolonged deadlock in the North Korean issue, are thought to have diverted the White House's attention away from Pyongyang. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. And in another sign, North Korea is seeking to bolster ties with Moscow. Latest reports say the North's trade minister is embarking on a week-long trip to Russia. Citing sources in the Russian capital, Seoul-based Yonam News Agency says Ri Yongnam is expected to arrive in Vladivostok on Monday, then travel to Moscow later in the week. Now it's speculated that Li will discuss the prospects of bilateral economic cooperation with Russian officials. The North Korean minister could also talk about North Korean leader Kim Jong-un possibly attending a ceremony hosted by Russia in May. Korea's shipbuilding industry was once one of the main driving forces for the country's economic growth. But a recent OECD report says the sector is now posing a threat to the economy. Our Kim min -ji explains. Korea's shipbuilding industry is facing serious challenges to getting itself back on solid footing. This according to a recent OECD report that says the global economic crisis has dented the industry's finances. The profitability or EBITDA on sales of publicly traded Korean shipbuilders stood at around 5% in 2012, in contrast to the 11% in 2008. EBITDA refers to the earnings before the deduction of interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization expenses. The figure also falls short of the levels recorded by companies in Japan, China and Germany. The OECD report also points out that the ability of Korean shipbuilders to generate enough profit to cover their debts has declined significantly since 2007. It says while their average debt levels were less than one and a half times larger than their profit in 2007, the ratio was above six in 2012. To be financially stable, a company's debt level should not be more than three times its profit. 
The shipbuilder's weak performance has also led to more government involvement, with government agencies increasing their ownership role in the industry and taking on more risk. If the situation were to continue, the report warns it could have an impact on employment and the financial sector, which could result in a domino effect on the economy as a whole. In dealing with the aftermath of the crisis, the report says the government needs to maintain a level playing field between public and private entities and manage its risks. Kim Min Ji, Arirang News. Despite falling oil prices, Korea's oil consumption has dipped to its lowest level in three years. The Korea National Oil Corporation says the country consumed 822 million barrels last year, down nearly 0.4 percent from a year earlier. In particular, consumption of kerosene that's uh, mainly used for jet fuel fell 18 percent to just over 15 million barrels last year. The Korea Energy Economics Institute attributes the fall to the slowdown in China's economy. Last year, China's economy grew at its slowest pace in 24 years at 7.4 percent. And now on to some tech news. The much-anticipated Mobile World Congress opens next week in Barcelona. It's one of the main places where you can catch the latest trends in telecom gadgets and technologies. Strategy Analytics has listed Samsung's latest Galaxy smartphone as one of the key gadgets to keep an eye out for. Now, Samsung is set to unveil the Galaxy S six to the public on March 1st, a day before the official opening of the event. The research firm also says smartwatches will be hot at this year's Mobile World Congress. Samsung and LG are expected to unveil their latest smartwatches ahead of the release of the Apple Watch in April. The Korean government believes one of the ways to attract more tourists and encourage spending is by building resort complexes with casinos. So two such additional resorts are likely to be built in the nation's free economic zones. And this time, the government is letting Korean firms to take part in the bid. Our Kim ji has this week's Industry Insight. Will the opening of resort complexes equipped with hotels, shops and casinos bring investment and boost the economy? The Korean government is betting it will. It believes it can raise 1.8 billion U.S. dollars from the casino industry. Now it's letting Korean companies get in on the bidding, a privilege once reserved for foreign investors. Just last month, the Ministry of Strategy and Finance gave the green light to the development of two additional foreigner-only casino and resort complexes in the country's free economic zones. It plans to select the two licensees by 2020. Already, the country has attracted investors for two complexes on Yeongjongdo Island located in the western city of Incheon. The Korea-based Paradise Group and the multinational casino firm Caesars Entertainment Corporation are each building a resort complex there. Both are seeking to be the Korean version of Singapore's Marina Bay Sands, which raised $5.4 billion in sales last year. But challenges lie ahead if they're to survive in the competition against a massive casino and resort complexes in Macau and Okinawa. But mainly, there's a China risk factor. The income of casinos in Korea is heavily reliant on visiting Chinese tours. That's because the Korean government currently bans its nationals from all casinos except one. The casino in northeastern Gangwon-do province, Gangwon Land, is the only one Korean nationals can go to. The other 16 casinos rely on those with foreign passports. The tourism ministry says the combined sales of foreigner-only casinos is at $1.2 billion, similar to that of Kangwon Land. The restriction placed on Korean nationals will affect the competitiveness of the Korean casino industry. The scale and amount of investment in the resort complexes is going to be smaller than in other neighboring countries. Korea is capping investments in its complexes at $900 million a year, a figure far below that of its rivals. Meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping is increasingly trying to root out gambling as part of an anti-corruption campaign. That has raised fears the Chinese government will restrict its nationals from gambling, both home and abroad. 
Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Bringing you the fresh updates from stories breaking in Korea and abroad. We give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Join Na Hyung Young live from Seoul every weekday only on Arirang. A peace march to commemorate the one-year anniversary of Ukraine's uprising turned deadly over the weekend when a bomb blast killed at least two people and injured many others. Connie Kim has this report. Unrest is spreading across Ukraine after a deadly explosion rocked the northeastern city of Kharkiv on Sunday. At least two people were killed and more than 10 were wounded in the blast at a peace rally marking one year since the uprising that ultimately toppled the Russia-backed government of Viktor Yanukovych. Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko says the bombing was aimed at destabilizing the country. Our opponents, our enemies, have tried to destabilize the situation in the country. As you know, there was an act of terrorism in Kharkiv and our special security services were able to prevent an act of terrorism in Odessa. Sunday's march was to commemorate the 100 people who were killed during last February's uprising and the more than 5,000 who have lost their lives in the subsequent crisis in eastern Ukraine. Four people have been arrested in connection to the bomb attack. Kiev says all the suspects have links to Russia and received instructions and weapons from the Russian Federation. Moscow has yet to respond to the accusations. The Ukrainian government is becoming increasingly concerned that pro-Russian forces are moving beyond regions held by separatists. Kharkiv is Ukraine's second city and has been the site of violent protests by separatists over the past year. Hours prior to the explosion, the Ukrainian government and pro-Russian separatists agreed to pull back heavy military equipment this week following a deadline set during peace talks in Belarus earlier this month. Also, in the first and rare sign of progress toward implementation of the peace deal, the first prisoner swap of roughly 200 men took place over the weekend. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The death toll in the Bangladesh ferry capsize has risen to 66 as emergency personnel continue to calm the Padma River for survivors. A regional police official said 23 more bodies were found when the double-decker vessel was retrieved, adding to the toll recorded on Sunday night. He said more than half of the confirmed deceased were women and children. An investigation has been launched to determine the exact cause of the capsize with the captain and two crew members in police custody. Authorities say the overcrowded ferry tipped over when it was hit by a cargo vessel some 40 kilometers northwest of the capital of Dhaka. Now, hundreds of Turkish forces entered and exited northern Syria over the weekend in a swift nine-hour operation to relocate the remains of a historic tomb. Ankara said it, it evacuated the remains of Suleiman Shah, the grandfather of the founder of the Ottoman Empire, from an enclave it considers to be its sovereign territory. Now, they moved it to an area closer to the border. Bashar al-Assad's government condemned the operation as a, quote, flagrant aggression. Now, meanwhile, the Islamic State group released a new propaganda video, this time showing 21 caged men in orange jumpsuits, who it says are Kurdish forces. A man in the video in Kurdish calls on fighters to give up their struggle against IS or face a fate, quote, under the ground. Now, shifting gears now, our question to you is how does the world view Koreans 60 plus years after the Korean War? Now, there are definitely some good traits about Koreans and their society, but of course, some negative aspects are there as well. Connie Lee has the story. So how do you view Koreans? A new survey of about 1,100 foreigners in Korea and abroad reveals both the good and the not-so-good perceptions of Koreans in the world. The survey, conducted by Korea's Institute for International Trade and reported by the Kyongyang Shimun, asked foreigners for their insights. Let's take a look first at the good. Koreans are seen as hardworking, with more than 21% of the people surveyed saying so. Then, they're seen as kind and patriotic. 
On the flip side, though, a not so good perception of Koreans is that they're too pressed for time or rushed, while 14% see Koreans as too prideful, and 12% see them as unsociable. So if Koreans are seen this way, let's take a look at how Korean society is viewed. The survey points out the merits of Korea's good customer service, the nation's unified spirit, and Korea's dynamic social scenes. But to the bad parts of Korean society, more than 30 percent of foreigners say it's too competitive, while what they characterize as Korea's attitude of superiority is also seen as a flaw. And while the term bali bali, or quickly quickly, is emphasized here in Korea, it is also seen by the world as a negative. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Well, on the cultural front, sometimes a message is more powerful seen, not heard. A world-renowned contemporary artist is aiming to send a message through her art with a new solo exhibition that just opened here in Seoul. Our Im Yoon Hee has the details. These straw creations look almost like a hut, reminiscent of a nomadic life, one enveloped in nature. But these works are actually scaled-down straw recreations of famous religious architectural structures from around the world. Artist Yang Hye-gyu is one of Korea's most successful contemporary artists, with exhibitions held around the world. And for the first time in over five years, she's having a solo exhibition in Seoul, with brand new works revealing her abstract views on nature, humankind, and the relationship between the two. I don't know if it's a strong curiosity or genuine feeling, but I hope people see this as an opportunity to see what drives my work. The exhibition features a collection of works spanning her long, successful career. She's most recognized for taking everyday, mundane objects and using them in her own imaginative way. As the artist mentioned, the theme here is Mother Nature and Humanity and how it can be restored. The exhibition, titled Shooting the Elephant, Thinking the Elephant, brings together multiple works, many rarely showcased in Korea, for a unique look at the development of the artist's career. But one thing stayed consistent, and that's the abstract complexity of artist Yang's works. Each piece requires an open mind and a willing imagination. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. Welcome back. I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. About 10 times higher than the normal levels of yellow dust continues here in Korea. And at the moment, Seoul stands at 421 micrograms per cubic meter, while the regions down south are a bit less but still at a very bad level. Now, this will continue throughout the whole day and slowly clear up by this evening. So try to stay indoors as possible or wear a mask if you're heading outside. Now, if it weren't for the yellow dust, it would have been a much, much brighter day because, as you can see here, the nation is under clear skies. Temperatures will be on the mild side as well, ranging from between 6 and 12 degrees Celsius during the day. However, there will be huge drops in temperatures as we move into the evening, so make sure to have extra layers with you. Now, going over to our readings for today, so it will peak up to 6 this afternoon, while the southern regions such as Gwangju and Busan will top to 9 and 12 degrees. And moving over to other regions, Jeju Island gets up to 9 as well. Tokyo hits down to 8, while Mount Kungang is sunny at negative 4 degrees. Well, that's all for now, Michelle Park, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world.
And that's all the time we have for now. I'm Nahyun Gyeong in Seoul. Thanks for watching. More updates coming up at 6 p.m. Korea time.